Oh, can we talk about some powerful things of God tonight? Can we talk about some of the deeper spiritual principles? I'm not going to talk long. I promise I'm not. I hope I'm not lying just then, but, but uh, I have, may have to cast the spirit of lying off of me. But, but I, I, don't have a, I, don't want to have, I don't have a whole lot to say, but I have, what I have to say needs to be said. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We're talking about a sermon series entitled, As a Man Thinks in His Heart, So Is He. And tonight we're talking about having the mind of Christ. Have, this is a big deal. Having the mind of Christ. So everybody, let's, let's turn to uh, Proverbs 23, verse 7. We're going to read it together. The Bible says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. One, two, three, read. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Let's, let me read that again with some clarity. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Praise the Lord. Now, this is deep spiritual faith principles right here. And this is the premise of our series. There's a difference between the operation of the head and the operation of the heart. We're getting that now, right? With the head, we're very analytical. Where the head, with the head, we can be very academic. You can receive a, a million thoughts into your head and not affect your life. But the thoughts that pass from the head to the heart are the things that you believe. For as a man thinketh in his heart, it doesn't say as he thinketh in his head. It says as he thinks in his heart. So we're talking about thoughts that have transitioned from the head to the heart. Now why is that important? Because the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10 and 10, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth, uh, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So with the heart man believes. Your believer is your heart. The womb of your spirit where life is created is your heart. So I believe with my heart. So the thoughts that pass from my head to my heart are the things that I believe. And here's the spiritual principle. I become what I believe. That shapes my life. That sets the parameters of my life. So if I believe the wrong thing, I become the wrong thing. If I believe the right thing, I become the right thing. For it says, as a man believes in his heart, so is he. He is what he believes in his heart. So it's very, very important to filter what comes into the head and what gets down into the heart. Well, we filter things by whether they agree with the word or disagree with the word. It's called the washing of the water of the word, Ephesians chapter 5. So if it agrees with the word of God, I can say, okay, I receive that. That's truth. That's eternal truth. I agree with that. Then it, that good seed of God's word gets planted in the good soil of my heart and it grows and it flourishes and out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth speaks. But if it disagrees with the word, I need to catch it right then. And I need to say, no, I'm not going to let that get down into my heart because that'll, that'll make a stronghold. Hard to root that up. God can by his power. Thank you, Jesus. So the premise of our whole study for these seven weeks is your head analyzes things, but your heart believes things. So you have to be very strategic about what you let into your heart. Only that which agrees with the word of God are you to let into your heart because you're going to believe what gets down into your heart. If someone says you can't, you won't, you never will, and you let it into your heart, you're going to believe that. And guess what? You can't, you won't, you never will. But if you believe the word of God, I'm more than a conqueror, I'm an overcomer. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Let me tell you, you are a, an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. You can do all things that Christ has strengthened you to do. And so what you believe is what you become. Say that out loud. What you believe is what you become. Now, this passage that we're going to talk about tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll read verses 9 and 10 and then skip down to verse 16, has this most important phrase in it. We have the mind of Christ. We're going to begin in verse 9 right there. Verse 16 says, we have the mind of of Christ. That's where we're getting to. This is a faith statement. This is a declaration. This is a revelation. Something that you have. We have. We're talking as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So how am I supposed to be 
thinking? What's the parameter? What's my goal? Well, who am I supposed to be thinking like? What's the goal of my thinking? I have the mind of Christ. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, eye is not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart. Into the heart. We're talking about what gets into the heart. The, the plans of God have got to get into your heart, past your head, and into your heart. Neither has it entered into the heart the things that God has prepared for those who love Him, verse 10. But God has revealed them to us by His Spirit. So when it gets past the head, the Holy Ghost takes it like a, like a running back with the football, heading for the, for the goal line. He's got the football. He's heading for your heart. He's got the thought of God, the seat of God's Word. He's heading for your heart. The Holy Ghost has got the Word, and God has revealed them to us by His Spirit. Look in verse 10. I want everybody to read that with me. God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. Yeah, He's revealed them to them by the Holy Ghost. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So when you're born again, you get the Holy Ghost. Now you have the mind of God speaking to the, or the Spirit of God speaking to your home, uh, human spirit. And the mind of God is being revealed to your spirit man. His plans, His, His purpose for you in the earth today. Now let's go down to verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Everybody say that out loud. I have the mind of Christ. We're going to say it in unison now. One, two, three. I have the mind of Christ. Now we're going to say it in harmony. One, two, three. I have the mind of Christ. That was very good, tenor section. Now, but nicely done. Praise the Lord. I have the mind of Christ. Now, to have the mind of Christ is not to have the omniscience of Christ. We think of the mind of Christ as the, div the, the divine mind so far above. His thoughts are above our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. So we're not talking about the omniscience of Christ, the all-knowing of Christ. Uh, Paul's very clear about that, that we see in part, we know in part. But one day we will know even as we are known. When we all get to glory, I thank you for that day, Lord, when the veil will be lifted. But in the here and now, right now... Uh, I'm not talking about the omniscience of Christ. I'm talking about when you, when you have the mind of Christ, you believe what Christ believes. Come on. When you, when you say that somebody is like-minded with somebody else, it, it's that they share the same worldview. They share the same beliefs. They share the same passions. They share the same goals in life. They share the same beliefs when you say someone is like-minded. You could take two mathematicians, and, and they may agree that 2 plus 2 equals 4, but disagree on everything else in life, and they would not be like-minded. They may agree on the principles of math, but disagree on spiritual principles, moral principles, emotional principles, uh, governing principles, economic principles, religious principles. I mean, they can disagree on every single other thing, so they would not be like-minded, uh, but we have the mind of Christ because we believe what Jesus believes. That's a powerful thing. We believe what Jesus believes. Well, what did Jesus believe? What is the mind of Christ? That means that we agree, look in slide two, we agree with the mission of Christ. We agree with the methods of Christ. We agree with the motives of Christ. I believe what Jesus believes. I believe in the mission of Jesus Christ. I believe in the methods of Jesus Christ. I believe in the motives of Jesus Christ. There's so many things that are wrapped up in our personal beliefs on how something should be done, why it should be done, what's the mission all about. And if we just get past all that and we just ask Jesus, Jesus, what is your mission? What is your method? Come on. What is your motive? 
regarding all of that. And to seek and to hunger after the mind of Christ in our life. Jesus, I want to do it the way you would do it. I want to do it because I have the passions of God. I have the, the calling of God. I have the motives of God in my life. I want to do it because I think like Jesus thinks. Come on. I don't want to think like I think anymore. I want to think like Jesus thinks. I don't want to do it my way anymore. I want to do it His way. I don't want to use my methodology anymore. I want to use His methodology. I want to be more like Jesus. Everybody say, more like Jesus. That's right. So to have the mind of Christ is to say, I believe what Jesus believes. To have the mind of Christ is to say, I believe in the mission of Christ. I believe in the methods of Christ. I believe in the motives of Christ. His mission is my mission. His methods are my methods. Come on, church. His motives are my motives. So a lady said to me one time, Pastor, I just had to share my mind. And it wasn't a good thing. I said, Pastor, I just had to share my mind. And I said, well, if it wasn't the mind of Christ, no, you didn't have to share it. Come on. Good. Because there's enough of our minds being shared. But in the body of Christ, come on church, in the body of Christ, we need the mind of Christ. We need the motives of Christ, the method of Christ, the mission of Christ. We need to think like Jesus, act like Jesus, talk like Jesus, walk like Jesus. Why? Because it's effective. He showed us how to do it and it's effective. He says, do it this way. So, the mind of Christ is, I believe what Jesus believes. The mind of Christ is, I want his mission, I want his methods, I want his motives. That's all I want. Just the way Jesus would do it. Come on, let's talk about the mission of Christ for a second. The mission of Christ is very simple. Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. Jesus came to reintroduce the kingdom of God. Jesus came to stomp on the devil. That's the mission of Christ. Right there. Glory to God. I'm all about that. How about you? Amen. To seek and to save that which is lost. To expand or reintroduce the kingdom of God. And to utterly, thoroughly defeat the devil in my life. Come on. Oh, thank you, Jesus. To seek and to save that which is lost. You know, as a believer, if I have the mind of Christ, I'm, I'm all about souls. How about you? We got a program on Friday night that has a potential audience from coast to coast here in Florida. They say 7 million people. I wish everybody would turn on their television at one time. All those eyes fixed on there. 14 million eyes fixed on that television screen right there as we talk about the things of God. Why? Because we're mindful of souls. Everybody say souls. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And here's the truth. There are souls that are lost. I used to be one of them. How about you? There, there's two, two camps. Those who are saved and those who are lost. <laughs> Some people think they're sort of in between, but they're not. It, it, it's one or the other. Some folks say, well, the good will outweigh the bad and it'll all even out in the end. No, 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 no. That's not the way it works. Saved or not saved. And you got to get saved. Is there anybody here that needs to get saved? Anybody on television needs to get saved? This is the day of salvation because there's two camps. There's going to be a camp of saved folks that are going to go to glory. There's going to be a camp of lost folks that are going to go to a devil's hell. Now, God didn't create hell for them. God created hell for fallen angels. But if you agree with the devil, you're going to end up where the devil ends up. Come on. And so I want to go to heaven. I want everybody else to go to heaven. How many of y'all got people in your family you want to go to heaven? How many of y'all work the next to people that need to go to heaven? How many of y'all pass people on the street that need to go to heaven? We need to be mindful that there's saved folks and that there's unsaved folks. There's more unsaved folks than there are saved folks. And we got to do our very best to be mind like Christ and say, yeah, I want to get you into heaven. I want to make sure you have eternal life. So we We've got to get our energies. We've got to get our prayer life. We've got to get our resources. We've got to get our energy. We've got to get our passion. We've got to get our unction. We've got to get our Holy Ghost. We've got to get our desires. We've got to get our purpose in life. We've got to get our mindset. There are folks that are going to miss the boat. 
There are folks that are going to get left behind. There are folks that are not going to heaven right now. And some of those folks we know by name. Some of those folks we know them. And, and Jesus said he came to seek and to save those that were lost. Oh, let that be the mission of our lives that we came to seek and to save. Jesus, you came to seek and to save. You got me. Thank you so much. Now, I'm going to do what you did. I'm going to try and get as many people into the kingdom of God as I possibly can. Come on. Come on. All it does is take a smile and a handshake. And hey, where, where do you go to church? I don't go to church. Oh, okay. Let me share some good news with you. I got a good church I would love for you to come to. I got a seat I'm saving for you. But in the meantime, just in case God should come back before you go to church, can I share with you some good news? Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. And if you'll receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now, you'll settle up your eternity and you'll know that you're going to heaven. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Come on. Seeking to save. To seeking to save that which is lost. That's the mind of Christ. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke 19 and 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That should be the motto of our life. I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. Amen. He also came to establish the kingdom life. You see, he gets people into the kingdom, out of the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of his dear son, Colossians 1 and 13. So he came to seek and to save. Now that we're saved and we're in his kingdom, now he wants to teach us about kingdom life. Yeah. He wants us to teach us what it's like to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, John 10 and 10. I've come that you might have life and life abundantly. His whole ministry was just talking about the kingdom. That's all he preached about was the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 4 and, third, and 23. Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. You know when it talks about the, the preaching of Christ, it always says that he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Why? Because there's kingdom life that born-again people need to know about. Because there's blessings in that life. Did you know that you're a citizen of the kingdom of God? You, we all know that we're children of a heavenly father. But did you know that you're a, a, a citizen in the kingdom of God? It's so important. Because in the kingdom of God there's blessings and there's obligations and there's promises and there's privileges come on that that are bestowed upon the citizenry of the kingdom of God yeah there's laws in the kingdom there's morality in the kingdom there's ethic in the kingdom there's a covenant in the kingdom there's a constitution in the kingdom there's an economy in the kingdom there's an army in the kingdom everything that a kingdom on earth has the kingdom of God has and we just have to learn how to operate in that kingdom. Well, the mind of Christ is all about operating in that kingdom. We have the mind of Christ. And Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So he gets us saved. Then he gets us into the kingdom. And then he teaches us how to be citizens of the kingdom. We're talking about the mind of Christ. And then it says in 1 John 3 and 8, he says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And uh, we get saved, and now we're in a new kingdom. We're delivered out of the old kingdom. Now we're in a new kingdom. But we've got to learn how to live in the new kingdom. But there's someone that's always attacking our citizenship. There's someone that's come to steal, kill, and destroy Always wants to steal. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life abundantly. That's kingdom life. But then he said, there's one that has come to steal and to kill and destroy all the kingdom blessings that I have for you. That's the devil. But thank God, John records in 1 John 3 and 8, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. I want you to know the devil has been destroyed. The works of the devil has been destroyed. We have been delivered from the curse of the law. We are free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. We have victory over the devil. He is a defeated foe. Sin does not have power over us. We have eternal life in Jesus' name. By his stripes we are healed. It is from glory to glory, faith to faith, victory to victory, that we live in Jesus' name. But that takes the mind of Christ. Yes, sir. 
You got to believe it. You got to believe it. That takes the mind of Christ. And, and here's the deal. Uh, as far as the mind of Christ goes, we say Jesus has come to seek and to save those who are lost. And so we say, I believe that. That's my mindset. I believe that. And so we get saved, but we don't know anything about how the kingdom functions. We don't know anything about how to defeat the devil. So most of the stuff that the devil is doing to us, we're blaming on God, saying, well, God's just trying to teach me something. God's afflicting me so that I can learn in the midst of my affliction. And we're blaming God for what the devil's doing rather than having the mind of Christ and saying, you know what? I was sought by the Lord. I was saved by the Lord. I put it put in the kingdom of the dear son of, of the Lord. I'm learning how to live as a citizen of that kingdom. And I'm going to whoop the devil every single day of my life. He's not going to steal my stuff. He's not going to make me sick. Come on, somebody. He's not going to steal my stuff, make me sick. There's no lack, no limit, no loss, because I'm not going to let him have nothing. Come on. He can't have my finances. He can't have my kids. He can't have my joy. He can't have my stuff. He can't have my peace. He can't have my future. He can't have me. No, in the name of Jesus. No. He is a defeated foe. But that is the mind of Christ. But we have it. We have the mind of Christ. Glory to God. The mission of Christ is to seek and to save those who are lost. That was me. The mission of Christ is to reestablish the kingdom of God. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. The mission of Christ was to defeat the devil. Well... I enjoy the fact that the devil is defeated in my life. How about you? Now, the methods of Christ are similarly simple. But again, if we have the mind of Christ, this is the methodology of our life. This was the methods that Jesus used. This is how the mind of Christ worked when he was in the earth uh, 2,000 years ago. This is how our minds should work now because we have the mind of Christ. Prayer. The methods of Christ are prayer. Number two, faith declarations. Number three, walking in the anointing. Number four, walking in spiritual authority. Do you know Jesus was a man of prayer? Number one, the methodology of Christ. Jesus was a man of prayer. I love this passage right here in Luke chapter 5, verse 15. Remember when Jesus healed the leper and he told the leper, don't tell anybody that I just healed you. Of course, he told everybody, Luke 5. And then afterwards, verse 15, however, the report went around concerning him all the more and great multitudes came to hear, together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So everybody, everybody, everybody in the whole region is flocking to Jesus. Why? Because he's got the right mindset. He's got the ministry. He's got the anointing. He's got the power. And so everybody is flocking to him. Verse 16. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. I can't remember who it was that said, I have so much to do today that I'm going to have to pray twice as much. There, there, it's almost counterintuitive where we think we've just got so much to do. I don't have time for prayer. But instead, we should be saying, I've got so much to do, I have to make more time for prayer. Because that's exactly what Jesus did. The crowds were thronging him. The, the demand on his life was increasing. And so what did he do? Prayed all the more. The mindset of Christ is to pray. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. If you have the mind of Christ, you're a prayer warrior. Those with the mind of Christ are prayer warriors because this is how Jesus thought. So this is how we should think, that we withdraw ourselves to pray. Once you have prayed and you know the will of God and you know the mind of God, then you start to declare. So you, you have the throngs of people looking for their miracle healing. You withdraw yourself into prayer. God pours his revelation into you. God pours his will 
well into you. Now you know what the will of God is. And so now you can start speaking to the mountain, be thou removed. Faith declarations, Mark 11 and 23. Once Jesus knew the will of the Father, he said, you can start talking it out. Once you know, you can say it. You can declare it. You don't have to keep begging. You can just declare it. When you know the will of God, you make your faith declaration. You pray until you know. I said you pray until you have the mind of Christ. Till you know that you know that you know that by his stripes you are healed. Everything you put your hand to will prosper. That the blessings of the Lord are upon your life. The favor of God surrounds you as his shield. That you know that you know that you know that. Now I know it, so I'm going to declare it. Jesus said there is nothing that you cannot move. There is nothing that you cannot change by declaring. Declaring the will of God in your life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believeth those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Mark 11 and 23. When you know the will of God, you don't say anything but the will of God. You say, Mountain, let me talk to you for a second. Come on, somebody. Cancer, let me talk to you for a second. High blood pressure, let me talk to you for a second. Poverty, let me talk to you for a second. Loneliness, let me talk to you for a second. You start declaring. You start speaking what you just got in the prayer life, what you got in the prayer closet. Now you know. You say, well, I, I read it in, in the Word. But sometimes you have to take what you read in the Word, or we should take what we read in the Word, and we got to make sure it gets past our head bone into our heart come on and that that's where prayer happens you pray in the Holy Ghost you sing in the Holy Ghost you cry and weep and carry on in your prayer closet come on somebody Come on. How many of y'all had mascara run in the prayer closet? How, how many of y'all tried to run around in the prayer closet but ran into the wall? How many of y'all just, how many of y'all got, got full of the Holy Ghost in the prayer closet and you got the mind of Christ and now you know the will of God and you come out of that prayer closet and it's a whole new ball game. You went in with fear maybe, you're coming out with faith. You went in doubting, now you're coming out believing. You went in questioning, now you got the answers. And so you're speaking to that mountain. Mountain, be thou removed in the name of Jesus. How can you speak to that mountain? Because you know it's God's will. You have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. Oh, yeah. Come on. Then, then you walk in the anointing. Once you know the will of God, you've been in your prayer closet, and you're making your prophetic faith declarations over your life, the anointing hits. The anointing. How many of y'all ever felt the anointing of God in your life before? You ever felt that? The anointing comes on you. You're, you're believing the word of God. You're speaking to that mountain. And the anointing of God hits you. And you're just like transformed. It's like the Holy Ghost is all over you. And it's just rising up big on the inside. And you know that mountain's going to go. I said you know that mountain's going to go. That mountain's going to go. Because the anointing. Uh, power of God is on your life. Listen, this is what Peter said about Jesus, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. God anointed Jesus. And then Jesus told his disciples after his resurrection, he said, this gospel has got to be preached to all nations. This repentance and resurrection has to be preached to all nations. And you're going to do it the way I did it. You're going to do it by the anointing. Look with me in Luke 24 and 45. He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Luke 24 and 45, 46. And he said to them, thus it is written, thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer, rise from the dead the third day. Repentance, remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem and 
you are witnesses of these things. My, my, my. How are we ever going to do that? That's a big commission right there. How is that ever going to be done? Well, let's see. If we had the mind of Christ, we would know that how he did it. How did he do it? What was his methodology? How did Jesus minister so miraculously, so perfectly, so effectively that he always got it right? He always overcame. He always cast out every devil. He always healed every disease. He always knew what to do in any situation. How did he do it? Peter said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Come on. Who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. And then Jesus told his disciples in the same passage we were just in. He said in verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When Luke talks about the promise, he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He said, Behold, I send the anointing, the baptism of my Father upon you. And tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. He says, you're going to do it exactly the same way that I did it. That's right. That's called the mind of Christ. How did Jesus do it? He said, let me, let me just put that into you. You're going to do it by the anointing. The anointing of the Holy Ghost. Someone say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. You walk in the anointing. You walk in the authority of Christ. You know you have spiritual authority. If you have the mind of Christ, you know that you have spiritual authority. It says in Luke 9 and 1 and 2, he says, And he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure all diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Say, I have. have. Come on, say it by faith now. I have have. power power and authority over all demons and to cure all diseases that's the way jesus thinks that's the way we think because we have the mind of christ back it back it up back it up back it up to luke 9 and 1 called his 12 disciples gave them power and authority over all demons so say it again out loud i have all power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases That's the way Jesus thought. That's the way we think. Because we have the mind of Christ. Let me just close with the motives of Christ. The mind of Christ is the mission of Christ, the methods of Christ, and the motives of Christ. And the motives of Christ are are so pure and so simple. It talks about his humility. It talks about his obedience. In the book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Verse 6 of Philippians 2. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation. Say no reputation. reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant coming in the likeness of men being found in the appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Humility obedience. That's the mindset of Christ. That's the motive of Christ. Compassion is the motive of Christ. Matthew 9 and 35. He taught in the cities. He taught in the villages. He taught in the synagogues. He preached about the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness, every disease among the people. Why? In verse 36, because when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. If we're going to have the mind of Christ, we're going to have a heart of humility. We're going to have a heart of obedience. We're going to have a heart of compassion. Say out loud, I have that. that. Come on, say out loud, I have that. that. Say, I have humility. I have have obedience. I have have compassion compassion. because I have the mind of Christ. Christ. And that's the big question right there. How can I get the mind of Christ. How do I get that? How do I get his motives? How do I get his methodology? How do I get his mission? We have it. We have it already. 
You receive it by faith. Like everything else, you read it in the Word. We have the mind of Christ. And we just need to get up in the morning saying, I have this. I'm not seeking after it. I'm releasing it in my life. It's something I've already got. I think the mission of Christ. I think the motives of Christ. I think the methodology of Christ. This is how I think in my life. I think with his humility. I think with his obedience. I think with his compassion. This is how I think. I think about how he did it. I want to do it exactly the same way. I think about why he did it. I want to do it exactly the same way. I think about what he did. I want to do it exactly the same way. Because I have the mind of Christ. Slide number three. The mind of Christ is the mission of Christ. The mission of Christ was the saving of souls, the building of the kingdom, the defeating of the devil. You have that right now. I have the methodology of Christ, which was prayer and faith declaration, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, glory to God, and the spiritual authority that I have in His name. And I have the motives of Christ, which was humility, which are humility and obedience and compassion. Amen. Say, I got it. I got it. Say, I got, I got it. If you believe it, say, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Did you get anything out of this tonight? Praise the Lord. We got it. We got it. We got it.